Man. Good morning, church. It's so good to see you and to be in God's house of worship with you today. A couple of things before we get started. I wanted to let you know that uh, one of our uh, wonderful members of our church, Peggy Cameron, went home to be with the Lord. And I wanted to pass along to you that um, her family will be pulling together and uh, coming together for a time to celebrate her life sometime in July. And we'll make sure that we get some information back to you. But just to uh, celebrate her life and certainly the wonderful contributions that uh, she made to so many, especially those in our handicapable ministry. I also wanted to share with you uh, a word of gratitude. Thank you for uh, almost 400 of you that turned out in those five meetings that we had to talk about our future of coming together and under one roof for worship and two services and two different styles. And, and I have to tell you that uh, the ideas that you shared and, and the enthusiasm that you had, I mean, some of you submitted some uh, like uh, graphs and uh, charts and stuff about things that we can do, and it was very helpful and uh, certainly is uh, some great feedback. Uh, probably toward the end of this month, maybe like in two or so weeks, uh, we'll be able to come forward with hopefully two different models uh, to, to basically make a choice from. Uh, as we had promised from day one when we began this uh, coming together, it was not going to be a top-down decision, but certainly one that we wanted the family of St. Paul to, to be a part of. So as we co continue to compile that information, we'll make sure we give you a heads up and, and let you all know uh, what those choices, those models look like for uh, traditional worship as well as uh, contemporary worship as we come together in this facility. But I wanted to thank you. Uh, for the time that you put into that. Well, not long ago, I officiated a wedding for some very special friends. And uh, what a great opportunity and what a great um, just gift to be a part of uniting uh, two folks that you really care about. And, and one of the things about weddings is that there's usually either on the altar table or a small table during the wedding service a candle holder with three candles in it, two on the side and one in the middle. And usually the candle in the middle is a little bit taller than the two on the side. Uh, before the service actually starts, uh, usually uh, family members or parents or uh, individuals that are very close friends will come forward and light the two outer candles uh, on that three candle uh, piece that's there. And those two outer candles represent the life of the bride and the groom coming together as separate people, separate spirits to be united in Christ. During the wedding service, uh, we take a change where the, the bride and the groom then come and take those two candles that were lit earlier by family members, and together they light the center candle, what we call the Christ candle. And as they light the Christ candle, symbolically what that means for us is two lives that are now becoming joined or united in Christ. Then comes the tricky part. They have to blow out their own candles without extinguishing the middle one and set them back. So in the end, what we see is the one candle that's lit. And I love the imagery. The imagery is as those two individuals grow closer together up to their relationship with Christ, they themselves become one. That candle is called a unity candle. Well, not long ago, I, I found myself in Lakeland. I'd received a call from our from our daughter that, that something was going on with her SUV. And she said, Dad, she said, the headlights work, the internal lights work, but I just can't get the car to start. And I said, well, what happens when you put the key in and you turn it? I felt like an Amco commercial, you know, like, rah, 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 rah. well, she said, it doesn't make any sound at all. And I said, well, the odds are it's the battery. So I went down to the store, and I purchased the battery, and I drove to Lakeland in a, on a hot afternoon, and I got to her, her SUV, and, and uh, David, our son-in-law, and Kimberly, our daughter, were there, and, and our two grandchildren were there, and we opened the hood of her SUV, and as I looked inside, I began to be convinced that the engineers of Chevrolet wanted to totally frustrate a father who was trying to do a good deed for his daughter. As I looked inside, I looked everywhere and could not find where in the world that battery was located. Now, normally, when you pop the hood, it's right there. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. So I had my phone and I went online and I got a YouTube video about how to change a battery in this style of SUV. And what they said was that one had to disassemble the left headlamp uh, assembly in order to get behind that. After taking a couple other things apart, you would find the battery. 
So, <clears throat> believing that everything on the internet is true, I, uh, <clears throat> I began to disassemble the front left headlamp assembly. And as I was pulling more and more parts of her vehicle and setting them on the floor, my new son-in-law decided, well, he would come and help out. Well, the more he talked to me about what I should be doing, the harder I worked. The harder I worked, the more advice that I got. Now, he thought this was going to be like a bonding moment with his new daddy-in-law. And, uh, but I, I thought it was more of an opportunity to give the young man some wisdom. So I'm down there pulling things out, pulling things out, and then David stands by and he looks at it and he says, well, I think we're doing pretty good with this as we're disassembling this. And I said, we, I'm the one who's in the middle of this, and you're giving me all of this wonderful advice. So I'm about two-thirds of the way through the project of disassembling things, and after about an hour and a half, I've had enough. So I take a break, and there are assemblies and parts and everything all around the road in the parking lot of where this car is. David comes over to me, taps me on the shoulder, and says, hey, you know what? If we work in unity here, we could probably knock this out in no time at all. And I said, well, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, I'd like to offer a suggestion. So being the spiritual heavyweight that I am, I backed up and I said, sure, go ahead and tell me what I need to know. Well, for some reason, he thought I was being a little crass about that and a little bit callous. And he said, well, well I think there's an easier way to do this. And I said, David, you're going to teach me how to take a battery out of a car. I've done this a thousand times in my lifetime. And he said, well, well, hold on. So he lifts the hood back up. He says, come over here. And we look down, top down, of things that I haven't touched yet, because remember, I'm going through the headlamp assembly. And he lifts up a little black lid, and there's the battery. <laughs> so <clears throat> I decided, I looked at him, and I said, wow, I can't believe it took you this long to find that. I've disassembled this entire car, hoping that you would know exactly what that was to teach you a lesson in life. And I said, you've passed the test. Well, what he said was true. Had we worked in better unity, we would have saved a lot more time. We would have gotten done what we needed to do, and we would have gotten off on a better foot together. Well, I was thinking about how the president and Congress seem to be having some challenges, and uh, just a few. And, and, and they're, they're both trying to come up with ideas as to <clears throat> how our nation needs to move forward, how we're to come together, how we're to solve an economic crisis, how we're to uh, put together a, an international policy, how to get people back to work, and all those things. And what I've come to learn about that is the president has ideas, and members of Congress have ideas, but there just doesn't seem to be any unity going on with the two parties coming together with those wonderful ideas and hashing out how to move ahead together. It's unity, and with unity, some great things can happen, but it requires the people who are involved in those things to work well together. And I was thinking about the word unify or to be united or unity, and really what that is is when a couple of things come together for a common purpose with a common goal, that generates unity. Now, the interesting thing about that is, is the parties don't have to agree on everything but they have a spirit that brings them together that despite their differences, they come together for the common goal and the common purpose. Unity in the church is something that's been on the radar since the early church began. There's a time when, when Jesus was walking with his disciples and he was teaching them and he was leading them and he began to hear some noise going on behind him. And what was it? It was a couple of his disciples who were in disunity. They were competing as to who would have a greater role in not only the ministry, but a greater place in heaven. After Jesus' death, <clears throat> the disciples began to scatter in different places. And they began as they came together to try to recall what Jesus had taught them, the things that he had said for them to do, the values, the benefits, and all the ways in which they could be in unity. And they had thrown all of that out the window because they would truly become many persons in total disaccord. And we find out that it takes the Apostle Paul to come to begin to, to preach and to teach and to bring them together to remind them of the importance of that. We understand also at the time of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down upon the church that all of that which was confused, all of that was disconjoined, all of the disunity that was there began to go away because the Spirit reminded them of the significance of what Jesus the Christ had taught them. 
Well, Paul began to run into several of these instances in his own life. And being an apostle, which is one who actually begins new church communities, the apostle Paul began to see some of the challenges that were involved in that. Because the churches that were coming together saw a lot of infighting. They saw a lot of things that were challenging them. And Paul continued to admonish them through his letters by saying, if you will just come back and be together under one common purpose, that in itself will bring unity to its greater level. He wrote to the church in Philippi, he said this. He said, if you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, um, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. So what he's saying is, if you have some of these specific trends that are part of who Christ is, that will make my joy complete by being like-minded, so having a similar mind, having the same love, and being one in spirit and purpose. So Paul is saying to the church in Philippi, when you think alike, when you come together in like-mindedness, when you remember what it means to truly love one another, you begin to identify the purpose of why the church, <clears throat> of why the church was created. He goes on to say, as he writes to the, uh, to the church in Rome, he says this to, to the Roman church. He comes to them and he says these words here. He says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of what? Unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that uh, with one heart and mouth you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, Paul writes, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. The key words here is, he, again, he's calling for a spirit of, of unity. He's saying that through your unity in Christ, you begin to see how to love one another, and by loving one another, you become connected and unified. Well, he begins in a letter that he writes to the church in Ephesus, and he begins to talk to them about some things that are going on. But unlike some of his other letters, which dealt with pushing down schisms in the church and, and, and uh, confronting false doctrine and those things, the, the letter to the church in Ephesus did not really have that function. The letter to the church in Ephesus had one function, and that was to demonstrate to the people of God the insurmountable love that, God, that the God who created them had for them, and to call them back, to centralize them back to that particular love. And Paul was saying also in this letter, as he was giving the building blocks as to what the church actually was, Paul said that when you think about a church and you begin to wonder what is the church's purpose, he said, you don't need to worry about that anymore. I'm going to tell you. So Ephesians chapter 4 is significant in understanding what it means to be a church united on purpose and in mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes this in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a, a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Now I love this. He says, live your life with the worthiness of the calling that you've received. So often we think the only people who have had a call in life are those who step into like a ministry call or ministry of vocation or chaplaincy or something like that. But Paul says every person who's been created through that life in Jesus Christ has been called for a specific purpose. And he says that we need to live, you and I need to live our life worthy of that calling. He goes on by saying, be completely humble and gentle. Now, these are traits that many of us are still working on. We strive to be humble. We strive to be gentle. And the more that we become united in Christ, the more that we become at one in our purpose together, humility and gentleness prevail. Why? Because it's less about us and it's all about God. He goes on to say, love one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Peace is the trademark as to how we keep unity in the church. Through this bond of peace coming together. He said, there is one body, there is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul makes it quite clear for us that there is one church, that there is one body, that there is one faith, that there is one God, and that is the God whom we claim through Jesus Christ, through the Father as the Creator, through the Holy Spirit, and that is what brings us together in commonality as those who serve. I love what Paul talks about here, though. He talks about focusing on loving one another. Now, we know that Jesus had a lot to say about not only loving God with everything that is about us, but that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And in Paul's letters, he mentions this phrase, to love one another, over 40 times. And in those letters, by mentioning it over 40 times, we realize the significance of the foundation and purpose as to what it meant for Paul to say these words. Now, Christians are unique. We're part of, a, of, of one another, and we are to receive one another. We are to think about one another. We're to serve one another. We're to love one another. We're to build up one another. We're even to bear each other's burdens together. We're to submit to each other, which means to respect. And we are to encourage one another. So if you think about that, what does it mean to be a church created through the life of Jesus Christ, Paul says that's the answer. It's right there, that we are a part of each other. We are to receive one another, think about one another, serve one another, love one another, build up one another, bear each other's burdens, submit to each other, and encourage each other. Christianity is not man-directed. Christianity is God-directed. And it's Christ-defined, and it is other-oriented. Which means that as we look at that model in, in, in the uh, letters to Philippians, where Paul says that Jesus emptied himself. He took out ego, and he emptied himself and became something of less value. He humbled himself. And therefore, that is what Paul says to us with that kind of direction of humbling ourselves, loving one another, caring, bearing with each other's burdens, we become united in the church of Jesus Christ. Paul underscores to the church in Ephesus by saying that we've been saved not only for our own personal benefit, but also to bring praise and glory to God. So Paul says that a, a, a huge aspect of what it means to be united and purposeful as the church is to worship God to glorify God through worship. He says then the second component is, is to understand the fact that the Father's mission is to bring everything under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So Paul says the way that you understand that is that you discover who Christ is. How do you do that? You begin to understand the character of God. You begin to understand the ministry of Jesus Christ. You begin to understand the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? You do that through learning the faith. So Paul says not only do you glorify God in worship, but you grow in faith through going deeper and challenging yourself through that. Here at St. Paul, we do that through source groups. We do that through Sunday school classes. We do that through weekly classes, adult, children, youth ministries, all of those things because of that foundational piece. He said, when you come to glorify God through worship, when you grow in your faith and you understand who Christ is, then you know how to give out of love because you understand what love is. And he said, in the way that we give in love is that we serve. We serve God through one another, or we serve one another through God. And we begin to see that. And that's why those three pillars are so important to the mission, to the purpose of St. Paul United Methodist Church. To glorify God through worship, to grow in faith, and to give in love, to serve others, and to be with the significance of that. You know, David said earlier, and I just want to champion what he said, we're beginning this four-week series on what it means to unite as a church, what it means to come together as one body, and especially as we live into coming together in one building versus several buildings for a time of worship. So this is a great reminder for us as to the goodness of what will come as we unite. 
And as we bring unity together in the body of Christ, significant things will begin to happen, and we will begin to see how discipleship grows and how we begin to be a people who knows how to serve. And, there, and the things that we will see will continue to bring glory to God. Now, let me tell you something that I see. I see a, a renewal of energy in, in God's church. I see an, an excitement in the lives of people. I see the people of St. Paul, something stirring within to where we are on the cusp of God doing something great through the lives of the people. That's what I see, and that's what's exciting as we move ahead. But I want you to imagine for a minute a couple of things. As we begin to live into that excitement, as we begin to live into that purpose, as we become unified in Christ, I want you to imagine what it would look like when the people of St. Paul come together in one building for worship. I want you to think about what it looks like when we begin to, to integrate more as one church body that we're no longer two buildings, but we're one building with two different styles of worship, traditional and contemporary, at two different times. But we're coming together to worship God. Visualize people coming to Christ and being committed to true godly worship. That coming into God's presence to glorify Him isn't measured by the songs that we select or the, the message that's preached or the hour in which we worship, but purposeful, real worship whose focus is solely on honoring the Lord and bringing unity into worship means being together in God's house as His family. The church, and fully committed to do anything and whatever God is calling us to do. Imagine what it will be like as we unify as a church and we see all the resources that we need to make ministry happen. And we realize that God has blessed us already with those resources. They've already been given to us. Imagine what it will be like when you and I freely give of those resources. And there's never a challenge or a struggle with how we're going to fund a ministry or how we're going to take care of facilities or how we will uh, pay off a remaining portion of building debt. But through the blessings of what God has already given us, it's already here. Imagine what, what we, the people of St. Paul, when we make a commitment to grow in our faith by being involved in a source group, by being involved in a Bible study, by being involved in a Sunday school class or a midweek study, what it means to be purposeful, to, to grow in our faith, to go beyond what happens in a day of worship. Imagine what that would look like. Being a per church of purpose means, as a people of St. Paul, that we celebrate not just what the Lord has done through this wonderful church in the past, but we recognize through the eyes of the Holy Spirit is how the Lord is stirring and shaking the world around us and calling us into a greater function and making his miracles visible in the here and now as well as the future. That we're not just a church that celebrates its past, but that we celebrate the now, we celebrate the journey ahead. All it takes to become unified and purposeful like that is one step at a time. Some folks said, well, that's like eating an elephant. Pastor, that's an awful lot to do. And you know what? They even dialed that down that the way you eat an elephant is how? One bite at a time. So we can grow in this way. The vision of St. Paul is an awesome vision. God created us to be a church focused, to be committed on worship, to faith development, to love through service. And as long as there is a family or a single person or an individual, regardless of the age, as long as they don't know Jesus Christ in Pinellas County, God is calling us to reach out, to connect, to invite and to love. And at that time will come that inviting them, they will become a part of a family of Jesus Christ. Our church's mission is probably one of the most aggressive missions that I've ever come to know. And there are some times that, that even I go to bed at night and I say, Lord, you want us to do what? But here's what I've come to know in my own life as I walk in my own journey of faith. The things that I can do on my own that I think are great things, look at what I'm doing, you know what? God's not in that. Because if I can do it on my own, it's of man. 
It's the things that really stretch me. It's the things, things that stretch you. It's the things that stretches the community of faith called the church. When we are stretched beyond what we feel we can do, it requires God to be a part of that. And then we can live into Paul's words. We can do all things through him, Christ, who gives us the strength. We begin to see what this purpose and level of commitment is as God continues to call the people of St. Paul to greater and greater and greater things. Here's what I believe that the Lord is calling us to be a part of in our level of commitment. As a person of St. Paul United Methodist Church, I believe that, that the Lord wants you and me to protect the unity of our church by acting in love toward other people. Why is love? Because Paul and Jesus, because that's the centrality of our faith. If we can learn how to love one another, if we can learn how to love the stranger, if we can learn how to even love our enemies, we will have unity in the body of Christ. The other thing that I think the Lord wants is he wants us to share the responsibility of the church by praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, and warmly welcoming those who visit. St. Paul is a very friendly church. But it means that we must become even more friendly so that as people come in, that we immediately connect with them. We immediately know that we don't know them. Even if they've been a part of this church for 10 years and so have you, you may not know who they are. Go meet them. Celebrate the commonality that you share. The Lord invites us to serve the ministry of the church by discovering our gifts and our talents by being equipped to serve by, by the pastor and by, by being equipped to serve by the lay leader and the spiritual leaders of the church. Understanding and knowing your knack, how God has wired you to serve his ministry. And, and last, the Lord expects you and me to support the testimony of the church. And we support the testimony of the church by worshiping regularly, by, by living a godly life, and through giving, by giving, we support the testimony of Christ's church. You see, God is calling not only the people in this room to a deeper commitment, he's calling the people of our community of a deeper commitment. Folks, there are 35,000 people in a five-mile radius of this church, and over 60% of those persons say they have little or no faith affiliation. That is the mission field. That is where we are called to go. We're called to reach out. To follow the Lord means that, that we're to be committed to whatever it is that he says we're to do. To go wherever he says we're to go. Even if it looks foreign to us. That when he calls us out of our safety zone, when he calls us out of the walls of our certainty and commonality, that we are willing to trust him enough that regardless of where it is he's calling us to go or what it is he's asking us to do, that he will give us the resources to accomplish what is of there. You see, unity in the Lord means to stand beside your enemy. It means to stand beside your enemy with love and forgiveness. It means to offer resources without contingencies. Or, or it means to come forward so that ministry to heal a broken world can happen. Commitment to the Lord means that our church is not a convenience. It's a way of life. And it's a way of life for your family as well. All throughout the Bible, we see how families and communities have been blessed, how they've prospered because they came together as a unified, purposeful, and committed body of people. Widows and orphan children and people who didn't have anything were all taken care of. Why? Because they saw the importance of unity and purpose, of sharing what all needed. To be committed also means becoming unified and part of the body of this local family. If you're attending this church and you have been for a while, take that next step as to what it means to become a part of this body through membership. Membership has nothing to do with how large we are. Membership has everything to do with that at this point in time in your life that you believe Jesus Christ is planting you here 
at St. Paul to partner with him in ministry. That's what membership is. And it means you can be counted on to do that. The best days of St. Paul are ahead. I truly believe that. And I'm excited at what the Lord is doing around us, in us, and through us. And the great thing is, we get to be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to what these next weeks will unveil as to the future of this wonderful church as we continue to glorify God, grow in faith, and give in love through the people of St. Paul. Are you ready to make that happen? Are you willing to do what it takes? Will we be faithful? I know we will. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for calling to our attention the importance of what it means to be in ministry. Help us to be on purpose and in focus, to be united that through the love of Jesus Christ, that even despite our differences, we can become one. Lord, there are families today that need to be unified. There are siblings who need to be unified. There are spouses who need to be unified. There are communities and governments and world powers that need to be unified. And the way that that happens is to draw closer to you. So God, give us the courage and the encouragement to take those steps out of the boat, to see the miracle of walking on the water as Peter did, to come to you no matter where you are, to be faithful and to go as we are sent. Bind us together today as the children of God as we pray the prayer taught to us by our Lord Jesus Christ by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.